I always have the jitters when I get up here. <clears throat> I don't know why, but it just seems like I pit out and I get all nervous in that, but really I shouldn't. Because if you're going to preach the word and you know it's the truth, you shouldn't be ashamed of it. You shouldn't be nervous about it. Today in your <clears throat> bulletin you've seen I've <clears throat> had the title of the sermon as uh, a God of convenience. <clears throat> when you think about that, you probably wonder, well, what is he going to talk about? I had had several other titles for this because a few Sundays ago I had one that was called Bacon or Eggs. And Connie told me, I'll never re forget when Bacon or Eggs is mentioned, that sermon. And I always try to have some kind of a, of a title that will stick with people. Well, I had several titles that I thought, yeah, they'll stick with people, but I thought, nah, I think I'll just go with this one. But the reason that I'm going to preach about this today was something that I had heard on the radio, a song. And I don't know if anybody listens to the radio much. I know it's not really that quality of a radio here, but there's an artist by the name of Jelly Roll. And probably everybody's heard him, it sounds like. And he's got some pretty, pretty different music. Of course, he looks a lot different too. But I'm not going to judge him by his looks. But I'm going to, I'm going to look at one song in particular. And the lyrics kind of caught me off guard. He says, "I only talk to God when I need a favor. I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. Who am I to expect a savior?" if I only talk to God when I need a favor. Now think of those words. You know, we talked about commitment when we talked about the bacon versus the eggs. What is commitment? Commitment is a pledge to a particular course or use. You're pledging to go a certain direction. Now what's convenience? Convenience, it suits to one's comfort or ease. Now when I say a God of convenience, do we have an attitude of that? That it's going to be to my comfort or ease that I serve God? As we look at those lyrics of that song, it kind of sounds like what it is. Is it their convenience when they want to call upon God? That when I need a favor done, that's when I'll call upon Him. You know, when, when, when all the chips are down, that's when I'll call it Him. That's not the God we serve. A lot of times you'll hear people say, God understands me and how I live my life. And I know He's okay with that. You ever heard that? How about, I have my own religion. Or I'll believe God in my own way. That's commonplace nowadays. It's commonplace. Because everything is I. Just like it said in the lyrics, I only call it upon God when I need a favor. When you look at these phrases, it's basically... We're designing a God that conveniently fits our lifestyle. Listen to that. We're designing a God, little g, that conveniently fits our lifestyle. The world's doing it all the time. They're doing it all the time. 
basically it's the creation creating its own creator if we think about it. The verses that we had this morning under my title John 1, 1 through 3 what does it tell us? Let's be turning to that. John 1.1, 1, 1, and we probably all know it by heart. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. That's the God we serve. That's the God we worship. Too many times people in the world put God as less. The Word of God is truth, as it says here. The Bible is the standard for truth. If we don't believe in the Bible, what, what is there to believe in? Remember, you know, you can, you can pick up a book, a novel, whatever. You read it, it's done. What is the Bible? It says it's the living word. Why? Because the true author is still living. God is still living. That's why every time we pick this up, every time I look at it, it's living. It brings something new to light. Most people look at it as basically a history book. Ah, it's history. Read it once. You don't need to read it again. It's not the way it is. The Bible is the standard for truth. In Psalms 12, 6, it tells us how important it is. In Psalms 12, 6, it says, if I can get over there quickly here. And the words of the Lord are flawless, or true, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. They're flawless. They're truth. We can't go beyond that. In John 17, 17, it tells us that His words are true. Remember, that's when Jesus was praying for His disciples. If someone proclaims something that is contradictory to the Bible, how can he call it truth? If, they something, if you say something that's contradicting to the Bible, how can you say it's truth? Truth is truth, bottom line. Not believing the truth doesn't change it. You can, you can say, well, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that truth. It doesn't change the truth, does it? The truth is still there. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed. And then it goes on to tell us how we should use that Scripture. We have studied that on Wednesday night. It's God-breathed. The Bible is our standard. Now I want to give you an example. If I have gone to the store and I buy four pounds of apples and I take it up to the counter and that gal takes that bag of apples and yeah, it feels like five pounds to me. No, it's four. No, it feels like five pounds. If I go to the hardware store and I say, I need 
12 foot of rope. Guy goes over there to spool a rope and he runs off. A couple arm lengths. Yeah, that's 12 foot. Close enough. No, I want 12 foot. We have a, a standard, don't we, of weights and measures. That's why in the fall before cattle are shipped, there's a guy that goes around with weights and measures to all of the shipping scales in this area to make sure that all those scales are right on the money. Because it's a, it's a rancher's livelihood how many pounds of beef he sells. Okay, and it's a, it's, it's a standard. Because when they weigh them here, and then they weigh them at the slaughterhouse, or wherever they're going, that the weights are going to be the same. That it's not going to be like, hey, I've got four pounds of apples. No, I think it's five. We have this standard throughout our lives, don't we? We deal with this every day. Everyone's speedometer has to read the same, or somebody's going 85 and somebody's going 55, but it isn't what it says. We have those standards every day. A standard for what is right and truth is the Bible. I think back, used to be that everyone believed that the world was flat. Everyone believed it. You, you sailed off the end, poop, off the end, you're gone. But that wasn't the case, was it? Good thing, huh? But everybody believed it. Did it change the shape of the earth? Because everybody believed it was flat? Didn't change the shape of the earth at all, did it? Because we believe something, does that change the truth in the Bible? It doesn't, does it? How can we know what is truth? Because we use God's Word to determine truth, a lot of times we want to take and pick and choose so that it makes us feel good. So that it'll, it'll, it'll go along with what our emotions tell us or what we feel at the moment. That that's what we want. How we want it to turn out. And we might pick and choose here and there so that it will go along with that. That's basically using the Bible to fit our own standard. But we have to go on what God's standard is. People have put their own in intelligence above the Creator's. But in Isaiah 55, 9, it tells of His ways are higher than, than ours, that His thoughts are higher than ours. In Dan's class this morning, we went over that, of how we think our ways are, are pretty good. But as Dan said, it's either one way or the other. You're either in or out. If I think my ways are better, I'm out with God. I have to be in with Him. I have to go along with what His standards are. His standards of weight and measure. Because if I don't, I'm not going to make it. Many use parts of God's Word to make truth fit their ideals. This is so common today. But we have Psalms 119, 160. 
Paul knows it just as well as I do. What's it say? The sum of God's Word is true. That means all of His Word. We have to put all of His Word together. The sum of it is true. Now, a lot of people today will pick and choose what verse they want to go along with their life. We can go to many places in Scripture to pick out a verse that says, well, that makes it a lot easier for me. I don't have to go through a lot then. It's easy. They'll pick a verse and make it stand on its own. And they don't bother to see the context of it. What verses might be before that or after that to take in the sum of God's Word? They pick and choose. One of the most common verses probably is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We remembered that at this table this morning. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Boy, that sounds good, don't it? Whew. Sounds great. And it's true. But is that all we got to do is believe? There's so many more verses in the Bible that tells us more. Why do we want to quit there? It tells us to confess our sins. It tells us to repent. It tells us to be baptized. To live faithfully. As a Christian. But why do so many people just stop at the first? A lot of people will just say, hey, was it John uh, or Romans 10, 9? Confess and believe and you'll be saved. Well, that's easy too, isn't it? Confess that Jesus is the Son of God and you're saved. That makes it, that's, that's convenient, isn't it? Very convenient. Is that what the sum of God's Word says? Why does Acts 2.38 say, Repent and be baptized and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Why does it say that? Because that's part of what we have to do. That's part of the plan of salvation. Mark 16, 16. Believe and be baptized. Why does it say that? Because it's part of the plan of salvation. So many people today want to have a convenient way of saying, I'm good with God. He knows me and, and, and He's good with the way I am. They want a God of convenience. God is a God of love but He is also a just God. And that's why He put in His Word everything that is required of us. Do we really take that to heart? Do we live our everyday life as if it will be our last and that we want to live faithfully and please God? Or do we consider that we probably have tomorrow and I'll get to it then at a more convenient time. It'll be more convenient tomorrow because I won't be so busy with things of the world today. When we think about our lives, how do we live them? 
I'm guilty of always thinking that I have tomorrow because I got a list of things to do tomorrow and I'm planning on it. Can I truly plan? The sum of God's Word is true and He tells me my life is like a vapor. That it's like the fog that rolls in in the valley. And you think, wow, it is thick. And in but a few moments, it lifts and the sun is bright. That's how long our lives are. I'm guilty of having sometimes a God of convenience that I think, well, it's, it's more convenient to do this tomorrow. I really don't have time today. In Romans 3.23, it tells us that all have sinned and came short of the glory of God. What separates us from God? Sin. That separates us from Him. And it tells us all have sinned. That's God's Word. In Romans 6.23, it tells us what the wages of sin is. And that is death. So if we've all sinned, and the wages of sin is death, guess what? What should we expect? Death. <coughs> Romans 3.10 says, No one is righteous, no, not one. Sounds kind of like a hopeless case, doesn't it? I mean, there's three strikes right there against us. But God made a way. God made a way for us. And He tells it very plainly. Now, we can't just take two or three verses and say, Okay, that's it. That's all I got to do. We got to look at all of His Word. Now, this is written, as I understand, that a third grader could read this and understand it. That it's not complicated. But yet, so many people make it complicated. because they want to make it convenient. If we just read the words where it tells us to believe, acknowledge that we are sinners, repent of our sins, confess that Jesus is Christ, be baptized into Him so that we can take on Christ, that we can be clothed in Christ, so that we can be buried with Him and then rise up again a new creature, a new man, a new woman. It's simple. But yet so many people want to make it difficult for their convenience. It's what the Word says. Truth doesn't change with culture. I may not understand every single verse in this Bible, but I'm going to accept it as truth. Because it is the standard that we have to live by. In Joshua 24:15. It says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Shouldn't that be our motto today? 
that we will serve the Lord, that we will take His word as truth and use it as our standard of weight and measure in our life. God has designed for us a way to draw close to Him. And He has put it very plainly in Scripture how we should do that. And yet too many people in this world want to change that. Let's not be drawn in by the ways of the world because it seems to be a simpler way of looking at it. It's very simple when we look at it here. A simple design that God has made from the beginning for us. If there's anyone here today that needs to make a decision to follow Christ to follow those steps that have been lined out in His Word to become a child of God. If there's anyone here that has a need that we need to pray for you in whatever way, let that be known as we stand and sing our closing song.